going to deep dive into Microsoft Purview information protection encryption. Uh, over to you, Anders. And yeah, we have Thank started you. the recording. Yeah. Uh, fantastic. I'm really impressed that you're actually attending on an event a Saturday. But of course, it's an interesting, interesting uh, subject, of course, and prices and everything. And yeah, maybe that's why you're attending a Saturday. I'm um, connecting from Sweden. Uh, right now it's uh, 11 a.m. The sun is shining and the kids are outside playing and everything. So, um, and I have the opportunity to meet you all guys and um, presenting at uh, this nice event. And of course, yeah, this is important as well. And what is most important part is that we need to talk about a deep subject today. The subject we're going to talk about is encryption. So first of all, before we kick this off, I can tell you a little bit about myself. I have been working with in this area for almost 20 years. I've been working with the today's subject for around 13 years. I started out with what we had for 13 years ago. It was ADRMS um, on premises solution, worked really great for office files. I also worked with EFS encryption to be able to protect non office files back in these days. And we still work with a lot of other encryption tools as well. Um, but today it's mainly the cloud solutions that we're working with. So I work for a Swedish company focusing on Microsoft security solutions and have been doing that ever since we started the company. We implementing security solutions and we also monitoring, we detect a response on security threats against these environments as well. And Except for all the security solutions that we have with the Defender product, the Azure AD, the identity protection, all these, the purview stuff is a really important part to be able to detect abnormal behavior, uh, data exfiltration and everything around that. So that's, that's what I do and what we do. Um, and as you can see, I've been an MVP for 13 years, uh, working close with the product groups in, in Redmond and also in Israel, of course, uh, where we have a lot of products that have been bought by Microsoft because there is a lot of great stuff coming from Israel uh, within the security area as well. So, okay, what are we actually going to do within these 45 minutes? I'm actually going to um, show you really the really deep stuff. You're going to be part of seeing this is a Teams event. So we're going to see how can we actually work with Microsoft Teams to be able to protect sensitive information and make this easy of use for the business, for the users, for the project members and such. And we're going to see an example how this looks like, how the end user experience is when we set this up. That's the first phase. The second phase, we're going to look at how is this really done? How do we do with all the great stuff that we have in the background with Microsoft Teams, with the uh, Microsoft 365 services, and of course, the purview services. How do we set this up to actually work as good as it actually works? And the most deep part, the third step, we're going to talk what's actually happening. What's happening in the background when we're doing stuff. So before we start with the third part, I would like you to stand up, drink a lot of coffee, do some jumping jacks or something just to stay awake and so on, because this is really deep. Okay, we need to stay focused. Okay, but we, we're starting out with the concept here and to be able to explain everything and how this works and so on, it's a good thing to relate on something. So I'm going to say welcome. Welcome to um, business case. This is um, typically that we see out uh, at our customers uh, in different um, projects and such. And in this case, we're going to look at a business case with a really sensitive project. Welcome to Project Delta. So this project is, um, of course, a sensitive one. It's going to include a lot of sensitive information. And this information needs to be encrypted and protected in all stages. 
and it's need to be limited to only the project members, both internal members as well as external members. And we not only have information within Microsoft Teams, we also have information within the different Office files. We have some of information within emails and meeting invites around this project. And of course, they need to use Power BI to explain all the things they're doing in the project with help of Power BI, a great tool. And of course, this needs to be protected as well. And of course, this needs to be easy of use. The project leader that is responsible not only for the project, it's also responsible to protect the information. Okay, so everyone just mute yourself, lay back and yeah, take some drinks or whatever. And um, let me introduce the project leader. Here is, his name is Peter Davidson. He also have a project number and here we have Peter. Okay, Peter is responsible again for the project and for the information. And we have done a lot of things in the backend to support Peter and his project. We need to have this easy of use. Uh, Peter needs to do all this task without calling service desk and such. This needs to be easy of use for Peter with his responsibility. Okay. And as I said, this secret project, including a lot of internal users, as well as external members, external members that need to be part of the project, partners and such, he needs to invite the real experts to this project. So the ultimate specialist, of course, needs to be invited to the project, and it's um, uh, yeah, it's it's me. Uh, I'm going to be invited to his project as an external user coming from another tenant into this project, and I need to have access to sensitive information for this project. And again, Peter is the one responsible to give me access. Okay, so what do we have in place for this? How does it look like for Peter, the project leader? Of course, he's using Microsoft Teams for the project and have a team site for this. Of course, we're using container labeling to define the sensitivity of the project. In this case, this is a confidential project. So with this, we set the classification for the project. Here we define for what information is this meant to be used. What is the restriction for this team site? Are we allowing inviting guests? Are we allowing uh, sharing externally, internally? And everything about access into the team site. I hope that you are aware that we can control everything with the conditional access, sharing setting, guest invites and such based on the container lab label. And that's exactly what we have done in this case. In this case, Peter needs to be, uh, have the functionality to invite external users. We have allowing that for this confidential information. He needs to be able to share information also externally, but limited to only the project members. So we have done that with help of the container label and with also the file uh, level as well with classifications and labeling. So if we look at what he have in place, if we zoom out again, and if he is um, um, needs to have the control of the information regardless of workload. As I said, Teams is one thing. He add information into this team site when it's regarding the project, but of course he needs to do other things as well. We need the the old way of communicating. For instance, you remember email? If you that was the thing we all used in the old days. We be sending also seeking stuff externally with emails. It's yeah, totally crazy. We did that actually for a couple of years ago. Uh, and he, we, yeah, we do in that still. So for instance, quite new things. If he want to send emails or for instance, meeting invites, we can limit this only to the project members, which means that the invite itself, all the attachment into this invite is limited to the project members, regardless of internally or externally. 
And we can, for instance, use uh, data loss prevention to prevent Peter from, by mistake, sending this meeting invite to a non-project member, for example. And with the sensitivity of the meeting, we can also control the meeting settings. For instance, the end-to-end -end encryption, or we can also actually internally control what you can um, a copy from the chat within the meeting as well. So that's quite new stuff, actually. That's unfortunately the meeting settings require Teams Premium, but we're not going to talk licensing right now. We skip that part. And except for files and the team itself, he also, of course, using uh, Power BI, a great tool to be able to show numbers and data around the project in an easy way to understand how is the project going and such. And of course, he can define the classification for Delta for that as well, limit that project report only to project members. And of course, Office files. As you are aware of, the sensitive labeling have been working for Office files for 20, I think we have 25 years now. We need to celebrate that. We have had the RMS encryption for Office files for, for 25 years now. That's quite impressive, and we still have it. So here we have the possibility for the one who creating information, the data in use, to be able to set the classification either manually or automatically. When we talk about information protection, we actually have data or information in three different states. We have uh, data at rest. That's of course it's information we have stored either locally at our on-premises file servers, SharePoints, whatever, or within the cloud solution, solutions, that data at rest. Okay, we can handle that. We can scan through this, for instance, with a unified labeling scanner, identify sensitive content, automatically protect and classify that information with on-prem information, as well in the cloud with auto-labeling. We also have what is called the data in transit. This means information that I send, or for instance, by email or sharing, I can take ultimately action directly when this is done with data in transit. And what you see right now, we have data in use. Okay. So in this case, we have made this easy of use. Peter can, of course, manually classify his information, but it's, yeah, we have the human part of forgot something or missed something. And what we always need to do within these kind of projects is we need to train our user, educate our user how information handling should be done. So we're doing the same thing here with this project to help and support Peter. This means when Peter is writing something within the products or within the email or office file, PowerPoint and so on, we detect where in the document do we have some information quite new in the new office release to see exactly where the information is. And we recommend Peter to set the classification. We could have ultimately classified it, but when it comes to train the user, I will, I recommend to start recommending instead, because that will train the user in a better way. Okay. So here we see that this document is now classified, it's protected and encrypted to the project, which mean, regardless where Peter moved these files, if he move that into, do you remember those? This is a USB memory. Regardless if he move this to USB memory, he by mistake sync his iPhone into iCloud. He by mistake or with purpose put this file into Dropbox. This file is encrypted to only the project members and Peter have the full control deciding who is part of the project and who is not part of the project. Isn't that really cool? So let's see how this is. If Peter now have the information and I am the external user not belonging to this tenant and maybe I've maybe I received a USB memory by a old kind of letter here. Um, and here we have content for the project. I can't open that because I'm not part of the project. 
what does Peter need to do to give me access to the file stored on this USB memory? Peter, add me as a member to the project. So here you find me. Here you add me to the project. Nothing new with that. You've seen this before. I'm a guest into this project. Normally we're talking about getting access into Teams, but now we're actually getting access to information stored on this small memory. So, and let's see what I have access to. This is still Peter's machine. You see in the upper right corner that you have the nice um, picture of Peter. If we look at the files included in this team site, we see that we have a lot of ProTelta information with this team. And um, either by mistake or with purpose, someone have put secret internal information into this project, uh, team site as well. Maybe we allow this, so this can be done. Maybe there is a need for the internal user to get access on some finance number. And of course, if it's secret internally protected, it shouldn't be possible for me to open that as external user if it's classified in that way. So we have that in the team side as well. And I hope that you are aware of that we now have the fun functionality to actually set the default label for all files that is created and uploaded into this cloud location with default label for the site. So we, in this case, have set that all files that is created on the team site is by default classified as Project Delta. But if someone have already written a document that is secret, classify this as internally encrypted, and upload that into the team site, we won't, we don't act on that. It's still remaining the classification and the permission only to internal users. So. OK, this is from Peter's side. Let's move into my side. I am the external user, you remember. How does it look like for me as the external expert into this fantastic project? I received an email. That's the behavior when you're invited into a team site by standard. Uh, with a nice picture of the project Delta project, like I see it's it's for now, four members into this project. I open up this link, which opened Teams in that case, switch in organization, and I will have access in directly into the team site for this project, limited. Okay. And if we look at the files, I can see all the files. Let's view the sensitivity. I would recommend you to add the column sensitivity to all your uh, team sites, including sensitive content. If I try to open up secret internal information, just test it out. I can't do that. I don't have access to the secret internal information. But I do have access to Pro Delta information. So you're starting by open up the project update that Peter just written, as you saw that was automatically recommended labeling and such. I can open that. We can, and in the most cases, we should block external user from downloading stuff. But in this case, I actually have the access to doing that. Maybe there is a need for it within the project. So I can open this document on my local word on my machine. What does that mean? That's mean that I know it cached the file on my machine in another tenant, in another organization that Peter's. And I can actually save as this document into, for instance, USB memory or locally on machine. This document is now not only accessed by me, it's only it's also downloaded and stored within my organization. Okay. So what, what about if Peter, now the project maybe is over, or maybe I've misbehaved. I'm maybe I don't, don't have the knowledge needed for the project. And let's say that Peter needs to control who should have access to the project. Let's go back to Peter's machine. The use case could also be that I have access to the information. I have downloaded the information, stored this within my organization, within our team solution. 
And maybe the solution is that I'm going to invite co-workers into the project. So I invite my colleagues into a team site where I've downloaded all the Delta information. Of course, they won't have access to the information because that's only for the product members. But if I call Peter and say that, hi, Peter, uh, I need more expertise. I need to add my colleagues, Tom or, or Lisa or Gustav into this project. Can you please fix that for me? The only thing that Peter needs to do to give access to my coworkers to get access to the information that I already have downloaded is go to the team site, add members into the project. When he adding my colleague Gustav into the project, Gustav can actually open the document and the meeting invites and such. Quite fantastic, isn't it? And the other way around, he is still responsible for the project, for the information. And if I'm no longer trusted for the project, he can go in and manage the team and actually remove me from the project. Which means that the file, I don't have access to that anymore. So you remove it from the project and let's see that this actually works. Do you remember what I did? I took the office document. I you saved as because I had that permission. We can block that, but I had the permission. Maybe that's needed for the project. And I saved the document on my machine. Okay. So now I have the local office document on my machine and I'm no longer a member of the project. How does this look like? Let's switch back to my machine instead. Okay. This is my machine. Here is the document. I open that up. It's tried to sign me in. But I'm met by a login prompt. That's a default behavior. We don't have access if I have several accounts. I tried to send me the same account that I used yesterday. I'm now blocked. I can't open that document anymore. OK, that was the first part. Now we've seen how great this can actually work. Ease of use for the project leader and such. How does this, how, how is this configured? Let's take a look. Let's uh, deep dive under the water here to see what's what's actually happening. First of all, we're going into the um, Purview portal. Isn't it nice with all the new names? We, we love them when Microsoft changed the name of the products, right? I was like, oh no, not a new name for it. But but the thing is, it's got clear for me when I actually translate what, what purview means in Swedish, because this means that we no longer are acting within the Microsoft premises. We're not, not only acting with information in Microsoft 365, not only in the team to Azure services, we have some information within other SaaS services as well. So we extend the solution into all kinds of location, cloud services and such. That's why we are changing the name into purview instead of M365 compliance, right? And here we have the sensitivity labels. Here you can see all the sensitivity classes that the organization have. And of course, we have worked with the business to define those. So that's one of the takeaways here. Do not ever try to implement purview solutions without involvement with the business, because this is not an IT project. The business is the one that should draw this project, not the IT. Me as a consultant, of course, IT can belong to the project, but that's not required. The most important part is to require the uh, external part. Uh, oh, sorry, the business. Someone wrote something in the chat. Um, so, yeah, you know, guy doing two things in the same time. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Let's go back to the purview portal, right? Here we have the labels. Here we can extend the confidential labels. Here we see the project. So, the sensitive labels classify the project, and then we use a policy to sign the project to the project members. OK, so only the project members of Delta project can see and use this label. OK, so we don't get too much labels for end users. So in this case, we look at the Pro Delta and here we can see that we have a lot of settings for the label. And what we want to see here is actually the encryption settings for the label. Here we have what's applying in there, what is called in the backend, the RMS encryption into the file. And here we can see that we have, in this case, permission to Peter himself. Why are we doing that? Regardless who set the classification of files, Peter have full access. 
What we also have is a group with encryption settings. The group here is the same group that is created by default when we create a team site. Which means if we, for instance, search this group up, we go into the Microsoft Suite 5 admin portal and we search for Delta. Here we see the group again. This is a Microsoft 365 group. We can see this is used for Microsoft Teams. And if we look at the members, when I'm still a part of the project, we can see that I'm here as a guest within this group. If Peter invites someone new into the project, they get a member of this group. If Peter, Peter removes someone from the group, I'm removed from the group and have no longer access to the encrypted content. And of course, the team site itself. Okay. Now we have done the first part of this looks like for the end users. We have looked the second part of this is configured. Not that hard, right? But we need to go into the third step. How does this really work? What, what's really happening under the water when this is done? Okay, so get ready. I would recommend if you have the coffee in front of you, take some sip on that coffee, do some jumping or something to stay awake, stand up if you're sitting. We need to stay focused here to get this right. Okay, this is quite advanced. Let's start with what's happening from Peter's side. You remember that Peter had the office document. He um, labeled the pro delta information with the world document. What is the requirement for Peter machine? He can actually do this totally offline without having an access to internet. He can still encrypt content. So let's start with Peter machine. Encryption from a local office. First of all, we have the requirements. We have the cloud solution. What's happening when you set up uh, MC5 tenant is that as per today, right or wrong, I'm quite not sure, but actually it's by default enable Azure rights management for a new tenant. For a couple of years ago, you need to activate this manually. Right now, it's automatically activated. What's happening when this is done is that an organization key unique per customer is created in the cloud. This organization key that is used by the Azure Rights Management Service is by standard the RSA 2048 bits encryption, and this is stored apparently in the cloud. If you have been using ADRMS in the past, you can, for instance, upload your ADRMS key into the cloud to be able to actually decrypt ADRMS encrypted content to be able to remove that ADRMS solution, for instance. And you can also use what is called the bring your own key to upload your own key into the cloud to, for instance, follow the regulation for your company if you need to create your encryption key by yourself and such. But the only thing is you can have a lot of keys in the cloud. All these keys can be part of the decryption project, but you can also only have one active organization key for encryption at a time, okay? so. This is done as much play in Peter's tenant. And here we have the Peter's machine and you have the project report and such. What's need to be done before anyone can start encrypted content, again, offline, if there's need for it, they need to do what is called a bootstrap into the machine. This happening automatically without end user involvement and such. The requirement for this to happen is that the end user, of course, need to be signed in into the office products. And you also need to have the Azure Rights Management solution activated in the tenant. And he need to have a policy assigned for his user. If this is done, what's happening apparently within the client is there is been, will be an authentication from Peter's machine into the service. And he will get back, first of all, a user certificate. This is not an X509 certificate. You, cannot, you can't find this in the local set store in Windows. Uh, this is unique for RMS and been done like that for 25 years, but it's following standard. We have a public key and a private key of this certificate, and this is stored on Peter's machine. What we also have is that he will get the 
public key of the organization key downloaded to his machine. With those two, the user certificate and the public part organization key, Peter can now actually start encrypted content totally offline. Okay, but this needs to be done in the first phase with internet connection because we need the authentication to be done. Okay, so now you go back to Peter's machine. He had the office document and he applied the encryption. What happening then? Okay, here we have the project report here. And the first Peter did was to either manually or with data in transit or data to rest, we apply the label. In this case, a project delta label. This file is now classified confidential, which means that we can take, for instance, DLP rules with conditions on that information and such, but we also apply the encryption. The encryption is in the first phase similar to EFS encryption, if you're aware how that works. All files, all unique files are encrypted with a randomized key. This key is following standard of uh, IAS encryption, it's either 256 bits or 128 bits. And why is that? It's regarding what kind of office product that is in use. Okay, so with the latest stuff, we only have 256, but as still Microsoft still support of all the office versions, we are yeah, still using uh, 128 bits encryption. Okay, so a randomized key called the content key, encrypted the content. And now the file is actually encrypted. But compared to EFS encryption, something more happened with RMS. Because we take this unique randomized key and we also get a policy for the file itself, including the permissions for the file. You remember that Peter had access and you had remember the group, the team site have access. And we can also define what we call the offline access, if we allow caching. Caching can give the possibility to open content without the internet connection. For instance, if you allow seven days caching, that file needs to be opened with internet access the first time, and then the user can open this for seven days, for instance. In this case, it's so sensitive, so we disable that totally. You need to outgate yourself always when you try to open this up. Okay, so we have encrypted the content. We have the policy for the file. What will happen is that we take this unique content key and we will put that together with the policy. And then we will encrypt the unique file, the unique content key, I mean, with the policy, with the organization key. Okay, the public part of that that was stolen on a piece of machine. It will encrypt the content key the policy, and we just sign this with Peter's certificate. And that is the RMS protected file. Okay, so, and what did Peter do? He saved the document. Peter saved the document within the team site, right? What, what actually happened when he uploaded this into Teams? The file was uploaded into the team site, and here something will happen. If we look at what's happening when it's uploaded, and we look at what's happening when someone access Microsoft Teams and make this further deep, what's happening in the back end here. First of all, we start with I was changing tenant, I accessed Peter's tenant with Teams. You remember that? That was happening. It's switching tenant, I get access to, to the product delta. First of all, we have my machine here in the lower right corner here or left corner. Uh, and I had to outgate myself. Here we have all the nice logic. We Azure AD, the conditional access, the identity protection part. Then we look at what IP I'm using. Is my device safe or not? And if that is the case, we allow access into Peter Rosation. Or we require me to enter MFA, for instance. And after a successful MFA request, I get access into the team site. Okay. Now 
I am here with my machine, and here we have the team site for Project Delta. What actually happened to the file that was encrypted is that this file was actually decrypted by RMS. Um, that's not secure, you say? Uh, the thing is, everything that is stored in MC5 is deeply encrypted with further encryption. All files that is data at rest within MC5 is deep encrypted. So we've removed the RMS encryption. Yeah, why are you doing that? Because this file needs to be able to be opened within the Teams client. That's kind of a browser into the cloud service. So we remove the encryption of the file. But what is really important for the files within MC5 is the access. Who have access and with what access do we have? So we remove the RMS encryption, but we still have the policy for the file. So after a successful sign in from Peter Machine, he tried to open up the specific document. He saw that I couldn't open the secret part, but I could open the confidential for Delta because he verified if I was a member of the group. And I was, which made it possible for me to open that document in Microsoft Teams within the browser, for instance. But what did I do? I opened this in local office. Again, we can block this based on the container label, based on the, the uh, permission and such. But we allowed that because there, there was a need for it. What will happen here, I download the file, is that this file will be encrypted again, stored on my machine. Okay. So the scenario could be that Peter didn't put this in Teams, maybe put this in USB memory and it gave me the memory physically. Here is the information for the project. So what is actually happening when I try to open up something, regardless where this document is stored, could be a Dropbox, could be a USB memory, could be a local file server, it could be my home computer. What is actually happening here? Again, we have my machine and we have the document. What will go to Microsoft? The document itself will not be sent to Microsoft. So if you have information that's not allowed to be stored in the cloud, nothing will be sent to Microsoft. What will be sent to Microsoft is the encrypted policy for the file. Together, when I sign in with a user that's happening by default within Office package, for instance, is that it will add my user certificate with my public key to the cloud service. With help of the organization key and the private part, we can decrypt, Microsoft can decrypt the policy to see who have access to the file. And they will also get access to the content key that encrypted the file in the first phase. And by the permission for the file, Microsoft can verify, okay, is this Peter? No, it's not Peter. Is Anders part of the project group? Yeah. In the first phase, I was. So, in that case, what will happen? Microsoft will, or the service itself, not a person, the service will automatically do this in the back end. They will take the content key together with the policy and they will actually create a new policy, a new certificate for this file, including the randomized content key that was unique for all files that are encrypted together with my permission and settings, what I am allowed to do within the Office package, for instance, or Outlook or meeting or whatever. And it will actually encrypt this policy. It will encrypt this policy with my user certificate and my public key of my user certificate. And this will be downloaded to my machine. If someone do a manual middle and sniff the traffic or, or in, in some way getting access to this encrypted policy, first of all, they don't have the document. Second of all, they can't use a policy because that is only possible for my device. Okay. So on my device, my use kit and the private part of that kit will be used to decrypt the policy, which give me the policy with the permission for the file, including the content key, the one that was used when Peter applied the encryption. And with help of that, this file will be decrypted with the permission that we have set on the file.
So this is actually what's happening when we are using Azure Rights Management. This is a service by Microsoft. We don't need to do anything. But what about if um, the organization or the information needs to be encrypted with a key that is not accessible by Microsoft? In that case, we have double key encryption. Okay, let's have a look. Uh, first of all, what is config in the portal? Oh, I see that we have five minutes left. Do I have time for this? Yeah, let's, yeah. Uh, stand up again, just get some air and coffee sip or, or something. If you look how this is configured. The only thing we need to do from the portal side is to point out where is the DK service. The DK service is something that you as an organization need to develop by yourself. Marks are not doing anything here. Do not use the pilot code. So in this case, try to either buy the service. Uh, we as a company have developed our service by yourself. Uh, with this, you can buy that from us or some other vendor or develop this by yourself. Okay, so we point out where is the DK store. And if we look how the encryption works, if DK is enabled and assigned to use with the project, in that case, you remember the bootstrap of Peter's machine. He's still out here to the service, and we are getting the organization key, the Azure RMS key, and we get the user kit. But we're also contacting the DKA service. The DKA service also have a public key. So we get two keys. You remember the name, double key encryption. And what's happening here is that if Peter apply encryption to the file, as you saw before, the file will still be encrypted with a randomized content key. Nothing changed here. It will uh, then be this unique content key that's encrypted the uh, document will actually be encrypted again with the DKA key, which make it impossible for someone, even Microsoft, to open that content. But we still have the policy and the permission for the file that is verified through the Azure service, which means that we can give access both internally, externally to domains and users by validating the access into the Azure service. And this will also be encrypted again with an organization key signed by the user. And now we have a DK encrypted file. If we look at the decryption here, the file could be stored in the cloud it won't be accessed by Microsoft, which means that this file can't be opened within Microsoft Teams. It can't be opened in Windows. It can't even be opened on a cell phone because that's exactly happening in the cloud. The requirement to use DKA is that the local office package understand this. The decryption will happen on the client side, on my, my computer, not in the cloud. This only works for client side encryption decryption. Right. So in that case, we will send the policy to Microsoft who have access to the document. We will still require sign-ins to the Azure service. We'll also great stuff with conditional access and stuff. And we're still using the organization key to decrypt the policy. So Microsoft still can do that for you as a SaaS service with access and validation of who have access to the service. We can still validate if I'm a part of the project or not in the same phase we did. But the content key in this policy, it's not accessible Microsoft because this is DKA encrypted. And what will happen here is similar. We will take the encrypted content key together with the permission, my permission, create a new policy in the same way, encrypt this policy with my public key. And now we have an encrypted policy. Again, we protect this, so you can't do manual middle and such. This is only possible to be used on my device that is bootstrapped. Here I use my user kit, my private key, and decrypt the policy, and we get the DKA encrypted content key. So what is built in in the modern office is an API 
So I understand that I need to go to the defined URL that was on the label itself to contact the customer's DK service. So this will be sent to our DK service. We are using the customer key, the customer organization key, the private part of that one, and we can decrypt the policy. That's getting access to the content key that is downloaded to the machine, which make it possible for Peter, or in this case, Anders, it was my machine, yeah, um, to decrypt the policy, get in the content key, and actually open the document. Quite cool, right? So this was the other level of encryption at the, the end, uh, end of time here. But if you have any questions, if something was unclear or anything, just reach out. Uh, you can find me on all different kind of locations and services and uh, emails and uh, yeah, you know, uh, all kind of places. So I hope that these four to five minutes bring you some light into the magic that happens in the back end to get some ideas. Over and out for the next session in a couple of minutes. <laughs>